Welcome to the late Alfred Hitchcock presents. This is the late Alfred Hitchcock, and I'm the presenter, offering you a story they wouldn't let me do on TV: the spoil sports. However, Radio Seven has no such scruples, presumably on the somewhat misguided assumption that out of sight is out of mind. How foolish! When we know that the imagination is a barely contained beast, I am living proof of the power of the imagination. For years, I have imagined myself to be a gentleman of somewhat portly proportions, when in reality I am a slim and athletic gay blade. And speaking of blades. Our tale today is a sharp little item about the murderous power of the mind, the waxwork by A. M. Burridge. While the uniformed attendants of Mariner's Waxworks were ushering the last stragglers through the doors, the manager sat in his office interviewing Raymond Houston. Well, there's nothing new in your request. In fact, we refuse it to different people about three times a week. We have nothing to gain and something to lose by letting people spend the night in our murderers' den. If I allowed it and some young idiot lost his senses, what would be my position? It used to be said years ago that Madame Tussauds will give a man a hundred pounds for sleeping alone in the Chamber of Horrors. I hope you don't think that we have made any such offer. Um, what is your paper, Mr. Hewson? I shall find no difficulty in getting the story printed. The Morning Echo would use it like a shot. Very well, Mr. Hewson. Get your story printed in the Morning Echo. There'll be a five-pound note waiting for you here. I own I shouldn't care to take it on. I've seen those figures dressed and undressed. I know all about the process of their manufacture. But I should hate having to sleep down there alone among them. Why? Well, there isn't any reason. I don't believe in ghosts. It's just that I couldn't sit alone among them all night, with their seeming to stare at me in the way they do. I warn you, you're in for a very uncomfortable night. Hewson had known that from the moment when the idea had first occurred to him. His soul sickened at the prospect, but he had a wife and family to keep. I don't think your waxworks will worry me much. You're not superstitious, not a bit. But you're a journalist. You must have a strong imagination. The news editors for whom I've worked have always complained I haven't any. Right, I think the last of the people have gone. I'll take you down and show you round. I must ask you not to smoke. We had a fire scare down in the murderers' den this evening. I don't know who gave the alarm, but whoever it was, it was a false one. Hewson followed the manager through half a dozen rooms, where attendants were busy shrouding the kings and queens of England. The manager stopped once and spoke to a man in uniform, saying something about an armchair in the murderer's den. He led the way through an open barrier and down ill-lit stone stairs, which conveyed a sinister impression of giving access to a dungeon. The waxwork murderers stood on low pedestals with numbered tickets at their feet. Recent notorieties rubbed dusty shoulders with the old favourites. There was Lefroy, the poor, half-baked little snob who killed for gain so that he might ape the gentleman. Within five yards of him sat Mrs. Thompson, that erotic romanticist, hanged to propitiate the British middle-class matronhood. That's Crippin. I expect you'll recognise him. Insignificant little beast who looks as if he couldn't tread on a worm. And there's old Vakier. You can't miss him because of his beard. Um, who's that? Oh. I was coming to him. This is our star turn. He's the only one of the bunch that hasn't been hanged. The figure was that of a small, slight man, not much more than five feet in height. It wore little waxed moustaches, large spectacles, and a caped coat. There was something so exaggeratedly French in its appearance that it reminded Hewson of a stage caricature. He could not have said precisely why the mild-looking face seemed to him. So repellent. Doctor Bourdet was the terror of Paris. He carried on his work of healing by day, and of throat cutting by night. 
He killed for the sheer devilish pleasure it gave him to kill, and always in the same way, with a razor. After his last crime, he left a clue behind him which set the police upon his track. When he realized that the toils were closing about him, he mysteriously disappeared. There's no doubt he managed to make away with himself. Uh, what eyes he's got! Uh, you find the eyes bite into you. Well, that's excellent realism, then, for Bordet was supposed to mesmerize his victims before dispatching them. I, um, I thought I saw him move. You'll have more than one optical illusion before the night's out, I expect. Uh, you shan't be locked in. You can come upstairs when you've had enough of it. Sorry I can't give you any more light. For obvious reasons, we keep this place as gloomy as possible. Hewson wheeled the armchair a little way down the central gangway and deliberately turned it so that its back was towards the effigy of Dr. Bourdet. He faced the sinister figures boldly enough. They were only waxworks. So long as he let that thought dominate all others, he promised himself that all would be well. It did not, however, save him long from the discomfort occasioned by the waxen stare of Dr. Bourdet, which, he knew, was directed upon him from behind. The eyes of the little Frenchman's effigy haunted and tormented him, and he itched with the desire to turn and look. He's only a waxwork like the rest of you. You're all only waxworks. They were only waxworks. Yes. But waxworks don't move. <laughs> Not that he'd seen the least movement anywhere, but it struck him that in the moment or two while he'd looked behind him, there had been the least subtle change in the grouping of the figures in front. Crippen, for instance, seemed to have turned at least one degree to the left. <laughs> he looked round quickly and awfully over his right shoulder, straight into the vapid countenance of Lefroy, which smiled vacantly back as if to say, It wasn't I. Of course it wasn't he, or any of them. It was his own nerves. Or was it? <laughs> Hadn't Crippen moved again during that moment when his attention was directed elsewhere? This was very cowardly and very absurd. They were only waxworks. Then why all that silent unrest about him? He swung round quickly to encounter the mild but baleful stare of Dr. Bourdet. Then, without warning, he jerked his head back to stare straight at Crippen. Ha! He nearly caught Crippen that time. Somebody was breathing. Or was it his own breath which sounded to him as if it came from a distance? He sat rigid, listening and straining, until he exhaled with a long sigh. His own breath, after all. Or, if not, something had divined that he was listening and had ceased breathing simultaneously. Everywhere his gaze encountered the vacant, waxen faces. They were like naughty children in a class, whispering, fidgeting and laughing behind their teacher's back. This would not do. He must clutch at something, grip with his mind upon something which belonged essentially to the workaday world. Now, what was that funny story which somebody had told him in the full staff yesterday? Uh, he recalled part of it, but not all, for the gaze of Dr. Bourdet urged challenged and finally compelled him to turn you moved damn you i saw you then he sat quite still staring straight before him like a man found frozen in the arctic snows dr bourdet's movements were leisurely he stepped off his pedestal with the mincing care of a lady alighting from a bus good evening you cannot move or speak without my bidding, but you can hear me perfectly well. Something tells me that you are, shall I say, nervous? My dear sir, have no illusions. I am not one of these contemptible effigies miraculously come to life. <laughs> I am Dr. Bourdet himself. Pardon me, but I am a little stiff. And let me explain. I was close to this building this evening when I saw a policeman regarding me as 
thought too curiously. I mingled with the crowd and came in here, and then inspiration showed me a certain means of escape. I raised a cry of fire, and when all the fools had rushed to the stairs, I stripped my effigy of the caped coat, donned it, and took its place on the pedestal. I own that I have since spent a very fatiguing evening, but fortunately I was not always being watched and had opportunities to ease the rigidity of my pose. The manager's description of me, which I had the embarrassment of being compelled to overhear, was biased, but not altogether inaccurate. Clearly, I am not dead, although it is as well that the world thinks otherwise. His account of my hobby, which I have indulged for years, was in the main true. The world is divided between collectors and non-collectors. With the non-collectors, we are not concerned. The collectors collect anything according to their individual tastes, from money to cigarette cards, from moth to matchboxes. <laughs> I collect throats. He paused again and regarded Houston's throat with interest mingled with disfavor. But you have a skinny neck, sir, if you will overlook a personal remark. I should never have selected you from choice. I like men with thick necks. Thick, red necks. This is a little French razor. The blade, you will observe, is very narrow. They do not cut very deep, but deep enough. In just one little moment, you shall see for yourself. I shall ask you the little civil question of all the polite barbers. Does the razor suit you, sir? You will have the goodness to raise your chin a little. Thank you. And a little more. Merci, monsieur. Ah. Merci. Merci. The waxwork figures stood apathetically in their places. In their midst, Hewson sat still. His chin was uptilted, as if he were waiting to receive attention from a barber. And although there was not a scratch upon his throat, nor anywhere upon his body, he was cold and dead. His previous employers were wrong in having him credited with no imagination. Dr. Bourdet on his pedestal watched the dead man unemotionally. He did not move, nor was he capable of motion. But then, after all, he was only a waxwork. Well, as with food and fashion, the French do seem to be at the cutting edge of murder. Until our next tale, pleasant dreams and vive la guillotine. Incidentally, no blade was blunted during the making of this program. Goodbye and pleasant dreams. The Late Alfred Hitchcock Presents is presented by The Late Alfred Hitchcock with the help of the actor Michael Roberts. It is produced by Frank Sterling at Unique for Radio 7. This is the late Alfred Hitchcock. After the success of my television series, Alfred Hitchcock Presents, quite a long time after the success of my television series, Alfred Hitchcock Presents, if we're being honest, Radio 7 thought it would be agreeably macabre to dig me up, reassemble me, and wheel me out for your perverse delight. And I must say, I'm pleased to find that I appear to be hanging together quite nicely. 
Not all of me is here, but at least I've lost weight. So welcome to The Late Alfred Hitchcock Presents, in which I'm posthumously presenting a new series of my favourite stories, all of them too horrible to look at, which is why they're on the radio. Today's tale drips from the poison pen of H. H. Munro, writing under the nom de doom of Saki. Sredni Vashtar is not the last despairing hand in a game of Scrabble. Rather, it examines our relationship with the animal kingdom. And my producer has been kind enough to allow me to bring my little pet into this studio. Now, Cuddles, sit up and beg for your toy. Cuddles just loves his tummy being rubbed. Unfortunately, that can make for a rather extended rub, since Cuddles is a boa constrictor. No, Cuddles, put me down, sir. While Cuddles is uncoiling, here for your delectation is Sredni Vashtar. Conradin was ten years old, and the doctor had pronounced his professional opinion that the boy would not live another five years. The doctor was silky and defeat and counted for little, but his opinion was endorsed by Mrs. De Rop, who counted for nearly everything. Mrs. De Rop was Conradin's cousin and guardian, and in his eyes, she represented those three fifths of the world that are necessary and disagreeable and real. The other two fifths, in perpetual antagonism to the foregoing, were summed up in himself and his imagination. Without his imagination, which was rampant under the spur of loneliness, he would have succumbed long ago. Mrs. De Rop would never, in her honestest moments, have confessed to herself that she disliked Comradin, though she might have been dimly aware that thwarting him for his good was a duty which she did not find particularly irksome. Conradin hated her with a desperate sincerity which he was perfectly able to mask. Such few pleasures as he could contrive for himself gained an added relish from the likelihood that they would be displeasing to his guardian, and from the realm of his imagination she was locked out. In the dull, cheerless garden, he found little attraction. The few fruit trees that it contained were set jealously apart from his plucking. In a forgotten corner, however, almost hidden behind a dismal shrubbery, was a disused tool shed of respectable proportions. And within its walls, Conradin found a haven, something that took on the varying aspects of a playroom and a cathedral. He had peopled it with a legion of familiar phantoms, evoked partly from fragments of history and partly from his own brain. But it also boasted two inmates of flesh and blood. In one corner lived a ragged, plumaged Houdan hen, on which the boy lavished an affection that had scarcely another outlet. And further back in the gloom stood a large hutch, divided into two compartments, one of which was fronted with close iron bars. This was the abode of a large polecat ferret, which a friendly butcher boy had once smuggled, cage and all, into its present quarters, in exchange for a long-secreted hoard of small silver. Comradin was dreadfully afraid of the lithe, sharp-fanged beast, but it was his most treasured possession. Its very presence in the tool shed was a secret and fearful joy to be kept scrupulously from the knowledge of the woman. And one day, out of heaven knows what material, he spun the beast a wonderful name. And from that moment it grew into a god and a religion. Every Thursday, in the dim and musty silence of the tool shed, he worshipped with mystic and elaborate ceremonial before the wooden hutch where dwelt Sredni Vashtar, the great ferret. Red flowers in their season and scarlet berries in the wintertime were offered at his shrine, for he was a god who laid some special stress on the fierce, impatient side of things. 
and on great festivals, powdered nutmeg was strewn in front of his hutch, an important feature of the offering being that the nutmeg had to be stolen. These festivals were of irregular occurrence and were chiefly appointed to celebrate some passing event. On one occasion, when Mrs. de Ropp suffered from acute toothache for three days, Comradin kept up the festival during the entire three days and almost succeeded in persuading himself that Sredni Vashtar was personally responsible for the toothache. The Houdin hen was never drawn into the cult of Sredni Vashtar. Comradin had long ago settled that she was an Anabaptist. He did not pretend to have the remotest knowledge as to what an Anabaptist was, but he privately hoped that it was dashing and not very respectable. After a while, Comradin's absorption in the tool shed began to attract the notice of his guardian. It is not good for him to be pottering down there in all weathers, she promptly decided, and at breakfast one morning she announced that the hooden hen had been sold and taken away overnight. With her short-sighted eyes, she peered at Comradin, waiting for an outbreak of rage and sorrow, which she was ready to rebuke with a flow of excellent precepts and reasoning. But Comradin said nothing. There was nothing to be said. Something, perhaps, in his white, set face gave her a momentary qualm, for at tea that afternoon there was toast on the table, a delicacy which he usually banned on the ground that it was bad for him. I thought you liked toast, she exclaimed, with an injured air, observing that he did not touch it. Sometimes, said Comradin. In the shed that evening, there was an innovation in the worship of the Hutch God. Comradin had been wont to chant his praises. Tonight, he asked a boon. Do one thing for me, Sredni Vashtar. The thing was not specified. As Sredni Vashtar was a god, he must be supposed to know. And choking back a sob as he looked at that other empty corner... Comradin went back to the world he so hated. And every night, in the welcome darkness of his bedroom, and every evening in the dusk of the tool shed, Conradin's bitter litany went up. Do one thing for me, Sredni Vashtar. Mrs. Durop noticed that the visits to the shed did not cease, and one day she made a further journey of inspection. What are you keeping in that locked hutch? I believe it's guinea pigs. I'll have them all cleared away. Comradin shut his lips tight, but the woman ransacked his bedroom till she found the carefully hidden key and forthwith marched down to the shed to complete her discovery. It was a cold afternoon, and Conradin had been bidden to keep to the house. From the farthest window of the dining room, the door of the shed could just be seen beyond the corner of the shrubbery, and there Conradin stationed himself. He saw the woman enter, and then he imagined her opening the door of the sacred hutch and peering down with her short-sighted eyes into the thick straw bed where his god lay hidden. Perhaps she would prod at the straw in her clumsy impatience. And Conradin fervently breathed his prayer for the last time. Do one thing for me, Sredni Vashtar. But he knew, as he prayed, that he did not believe. He knew that the woman would come out presently with that pursed smile he loathed so well on her face, and that in an hour or two the gardener would carry away his wonderful god, a god no longer, but a simple brown ferret in a hutch. And he knew that the woman would triumph always as she triumphed now, and that he would grow ever more sickly under her pestering and domineering and superior wisdom. Till one day, nothing would matter much more with him, and the doctor would be proved right. And in the sting and misery of his defeat, he began to chant the hymn of his threatened idol. Sredni Vashtar went forth. His thoughts were red thoughts, and his teeth were white. His enemies called for peace, but he brought them death. Sredni Vashtar the Beautiful. And then, of a sudden, he stopped his chanting and drew closer to the window pane. 
The door of the shed still stood ajar as it had been left, and the minutes were slipping by. They were long minutes, but they slipped by nevertheless. He watched the starlings running and flying in little parties across the lawn. He counted them over and over again, with one eye always on that swinging door. A sour-faced maid came in to lay the table for tea, and still Conradin stood, and waited, and watched. Hope had crept by inches into his heart, and now a look of triumph began to blaze in his eyes. That had only known the wistful patience of defeat. Under his breath, with a furtive exultation, he began once again the pean of victory and devastation. His thoughts were red, and his teeth were white. Then there's Sredni Vashtar, the beautiful. And presently his eyes were rewarded. Out through that doorway. Came a long, low, yellow and brown beast, with eyes a blink at the waning daylight, and dark, wet stains around the fur of jaws and throat. Conradin dropped on his knees. The great polecat ferret made its way down to a small brook at the foot of the garden, drank for a moment, then crossed a little plank bridge and was lost to sight in the bushes. Such was the passing of Sredni Vashtar. Tea is ready," said the sour-faced maid. "Where is the mistress?" "She went down to the shed some time ago," said Comradin. And while the maid went to summon her mistress to tea, Comradin fished a toasting fork out of the sideboard drawer, and proceeded to toast himself a piece of bread. And during the toasting of it, and the buttering of it with much butter. And the slow enjoyment of eating it, Conradin listened to the noises and silences which fell in quick spasms beyond the dining room door. The loud, foolish screaming of the maid, the answering chorus of wondering ejaculations from the kitchen region, the scattering footsteps and hurried embassies for outside help, and then, after a lull, the sacred sobbings and the shuffling tread. Of those who bore a heavy burden into the house, whoever will break it to the poor child, I couldn't for the life of me. And while they debated the matter among themselves, Comradin made himself another piece of toast. Well, that just goes to show the truth of that old adage: a ferret in the hand is worth two down the trousers. Until we meet again, good night and pleasant dreams. The late Alfred Hitchcock presents is presented by the late Alfred Hitchcock with the help of the actor Michael Roberts. It is produced by Frank Sterling at Unique for Radio Seven. This is the late Alfred Hitchcock, coming to you through the medium of radio. I use the word medium in its blithe spirit sense, since those Radio Seven boffins have devised a way of harnessing residual vibrations in the ether to channel the talents of the deceased. Do listen out for two exciting cookery shows presented by the mortally challenged: Rome Cooking, to a soundtrack by Nero, and a hundred and one things to do with a dead goat, presented rather excitedly by Attila the Hun. And now for today's menu. A twisted tale which concerns itself with the sacrifices one makes for art. The Perfectionist, by Margaret St. Clair. I had nightmares about it for several years afterward. It began when I went to live with Aunt Muriel in 1933. I hadn't had a job for six months when I got the letter of invitation from her, and I hadn't eaten much at all for two weeks. She explained that she was an old woman. 
getting lonely, and felt the need of some kindred face near her. There was a money order in the letter and a ticket to Downey, where she lived. So good of you to come, Charles. Aunt Muriel didn't look any older to me than she had fifteen years before. She'd been held together by whalebone and neck collars then, and she still was. I put the more flattering portion of this idea into words. Oh, Charles, you flatterer. It developed that I was expected to make myself useful in small ways. Like walking the dog, an unpleasant Pomeranian named Teddy, and taking letters to the mailbox. This was perfectly all right with me. Picking Teddy up off of the floor, she launched out in an account of what she called her hobby. In the last year or so, she'd taken up drawing, and it had become almost an obsession. They were all of the same subject: four apples and a low china bowl. Aunt Muriel had erased and re-erased until the surface of the paper was gritty and miserable. I couldn't bear to stop until they were perfect. I had the biggest difficulty: the apples kept withering. It wasn't until Amy, the maid, you know, thought of dipping them in melted wax that they lasted long enough. Good idea. Yes, wasn't it? But you know, Charles, I've gotten rather tired of apples lately. I've been thinking that little tree out on the lawn would make a good subject. I believe I'll try it this afternoon while you take Teddy for a little walk. I carried the stool, the easel, the box of pencils, and the paper out into the garden for her. Then, though I'd much rather have had an after lunch and nap upstairs, I snapped the lead on Teddy's objectionable little collar and started out for a survey of the town of Downey. I expected to find Aunt Muriel on the lawn when I got back, but she wasn't in sight. So I let Teddy climb into his box in the dining room, and went upstairs for that belated nap. Dinner was good and plentiful. My aunt, however, was definitely snappish. My drawing went badly. The wind kept whipping those leaves around until I couldn't get a thing down. I can't work with anything unless it's absolutely still. I wonder, Charles. I've been thinking. I want you to chop that tree down for me tomorrow and bring it into the house. But it won't last long after it's been cut down. Oh, Amy is wonderful with flowers. She puts aspirin and sugar in the water, and they last forever. Immediately after breakfast next morning. Aunt Muriel led me to the tool shed in the rear of the house and gave me a rusty hatchet. Feeling like a murderer, I severed the little sapling from its trunk with a couple of chops, and then carried it into the house. I spent the next three days working in the garden. I've always liked gardening. On Friday morning at breakfast, I found a five-dollar bill folded up in my napkin. I raised my eyebrows towards Aunt Muriel. She nodded. Yes, it was for me. It really was extraordinarily decent of her to provide me with cigarette money, and I resolved to go shopping for a little present for her that afternoon. I found the resources of Downey were limited. After hesitating between a china fawn and a bowl of fantail goldfish, I decided that the goldfish had more verve. Aunt Muriel seemed genuinely delighted with the fish. She ended by installing the bowl on the little stand beside her easel. About the middle of my second week with Aunt Muriel, the peach tree withered beyond any hope. The next day, she flitted restlessly through the house looking for something to draw. I noticed when I went into lunch that she kept watching the goldfish bowl speculatively. That night, she led me to the kitchen with an air of mysterious triumph. I was a little nervous about it, but really, it came out ever so well. She opened the refrigerator and pulled out the goldfish bowl. I knew the fish would never hold still, and yet I was just aching to draw them. So I just turned the cold control way down and put the bowl in, and came back in a couple of hours, and it was frozen solid. And now I'll be able to draw them without any trouble. Isn't it wonderful? I went upstairs as soon as I decently could, 
The incident left an unpleasant taste in my mouth. The next morning, I went down to breakfast. After the meal was over, Aunt Muriel got the bowl out of the refrigerator and set to work. I went out in the shed and messed around with the spray gun for a while. Looking up at the scaling side of the house, I had an idea. Why not repaint it? The work proceeded slowly. Spring drifted imperceptibly into early summer, and I was still painting the house, and Aunt Muriel was still drawing the goldfish, both of us increasingly absorbed in our tasks. I was having a pretty good time. I got the painting on the house done the day before Aunt Muriel decided she had exhausted the goldfish. I felt like celebrating. Aunt Muriel handed me the last of the goldfish studies at dinner the next day, and I went over the entire group with her. Charles, I've been wondering, do you suppose Teddy would be a good subject for me next? I looked down at the little animal where he was lying in her lap and said, yes, I thought he would, but would he hold still long enough? I don't know. I'll have to try to think of something. The next day, my aunt told me to take Teddy for a walk and to get him thoroughly tired out. She was going to feed him when I got back, and she hoped that the exercise, plus the food, might make him comatose enough to serve as a model. Teddy and I assessed every lamppost in Downey at least twice, and if he wasn't tired out when I brought him back, he should have been. My aunt led him to the pantry where his food dish was waiting. Teddy ate like a little pig. When he'd finished, he lay down on the floor with a resolute air. He was snoring before I left the room. We had lunch late that day, so Aunt Muriel would be able to take full advantage of Teddy's lethargy. I was hungry, and Amy had prepared a really snazzy meal. As a result, it wasn't until I'd finished with the fresh peach mousse that I paid much attention to my aunt. Then I saw she was looking distracted and morose. Didn't the drawing go well this morning, Aunt Muriel? No, Charles, it did not. Teddy kept twitching and jumping and panting in his sleep until, well, it was quite impossible. I think, Charles, I'll go into town this afternoon, buy a few little things for Teddy. For a moment, something cold slid up and down my spine. She came up to my room just before dinner and showed me what she'd bought for Teddy. There was a bright red collar with a little bell and a box of some weird confection called Dog Treat. She put the collar on Teddy while I watched and then gave him two of the dark brown lozenges out of the Dog Treat box. He ate them with a flurry of little growls and seemed to relish them. Sunday morning, I found Aunt Muriel standing in the hallway having what looked like a fit. <laughs> it's Teddy! Oh, Charles, he's dead. He was awfully sick, so I called the doctor. But when he got here, poor little Teddy was, was gone. Somebody must have poisoned him. Dr. Jones took poor little Teddy away in a bag. He's going to take him to a man he knows and have him stuffed. Stuffed? I felt sweat break out along my shoulder blades. It's such a comfort to me anyway to think that he did enjoy his last day on Earth. <laughs> After a while, I got a calm enough so I could go to my room. My heart was beating hard and quick. The next day was muggy and overcast. I decided to give the oriental cherries a light going over with the pruning shears, and when I'd finished, I went into the shed for some linseed oil and Bordeaux to mix a poultice for their wounds. Reaching for the can, an unfamiliar gleam in the corner behind it caught my eyes. It was a can of arsenate of lead, and about a quarter of an inch of the poison was gone. Well, I got over it. Two or three days later, when Teddy came back from the taxidermists, I'd pushed the whole thing to the back of my mind. And even when Aunt Muriel got her pencils and started on an endless series of sketches of the little stuffed animal, it was all right with me. One hot night toward the end of August, my aunt got out the packet of drawings she'd made of Teddy, and I went over them with her. I think I'll try a few more, and then... Well... 
I must get something else. The subject made me uneasy somehow. Charles, you've made an old woman very happy. Would you like it, Charles, if, if I were to advance you the money to set up a little nursery business here in Downey? The old darling, a business of my own. She was better than a fairy godmother. When I went upstairs to bed, I was feeling so elated I didn't think I could ever get to bed. I corked off almost as soon as my head hit the pillow. I woke about three in the morning. My mind filled with an unalterable conviction: Aunt Muriel was going to kill me. Lovingly, regretfully, she was going to put poison in my food or in my drink. Lovingly, regretfully, she was going to watch my agonies, and after I was dead, she gave me to the best mortician in Downey to embalm. A week later, after drawing me for eighteen hours daily, she consigned me to the earth, still regretfully, but with her regret a little alleviated by the knowledge that my last days on earth have been happy ones. The nursery business was, you see, to be the equivalent for me of Teddy's red collar and chocolate-flavored bone. I dressed, threw things into my suitcase, and I caught the five-thirty train for the city. I never heard from Aunt Muriel again, but there's one thing I'd give a good deal to know. What did Aunt Muriel draw next? How refreshing to encounter someone who took her art so deadly seriously. I wish you could see me here, in my paint-spattered smock and jaunty beret, palette in one hand and dry martini in the other, as I size up my life model here in the Bates Motel. Mrs. Bates is the perfect model, and always keeps dead still. Or should that be still dead? Good night. Pleasant dream. The late Alfred Hitchcock presents is presented by the late Alfred Hitchcock with the help of the actor Michael Roberts. It is produced by Frank Sterling at Unique for Radio Seven. Welcome to the late Alfred Hitchcock presents. Today, I've succumbed to an attack of the bucolic, so here we are, down on the farm. You'd be surprised at the amount of mayhem attached to husbandry. Why, here's a slab of butter being churned to within an inch of its life. Frightful. And their whipping cream, savagely. <coughs> Such a racket. Today's tale takes us to a farm in South Africa, where the chickens have most definitely come home to roost. Here is being a murderer myself, by Arthur Williams. Being a murderer myself, I was very interested in the statement: the best and most stimulating detective stories being written today are those that stress the puzzle of why, at least co-equally with who and how. I do not consider wasted the time spent on the puzzle of how, since it often decides whether the killer is to become famous, as a failure, or unknown, as a success. We murderers. Do not always make a mistake. On the whole, we are very efficient. It is for this reason, therefore, that I have decided to make public my experience of murder. I felt no animosity towards Susan Braithwaite when I killed her. I had been very fond of her once, and would have married her if she'd not been so stupid as to choose Stanley Braithwaite for her husband. Still, I had felt that if she wanted to marry moneybags, that was her own funeral. 
I had hoped never to see her again. Eighteen months later, I found Susan on the step, suitcase in hand. When she could bear his insensitiveness no longer, she'd walked out on him and had come to me, for she felt that I would help her for old times' sake. She didn't notice that I was highly displeased. After she jilted me, I'd worked her out of my system, at the same time making extensive improvements on my poultry farm. I'd made the whole farm self-supporting, was able to run the whole place single-handed. But with Susan there, my routine would probably have got interfered with, and the 3,000 chickens, which were at the most awkward age, might have caught cold or contracted some other ailment they are susceptible to. All this passed through my mind while she chattered away. I guessed in what manner she wished me to help her, and my annoyance mounted. I saw my little bit of money being spent on lawyers, my comfortable and satisfying life being disturbed, in short, the whole of my nicely settled life being completely upset. I became so enraged that I thought, really, I could wring her neck. The actual strangling was more difficult than one would have thought. By crouching behind the back of the couch, I was able to press her neck and head firmly against it, and so, by hanging on like grim death, avoid my hands becoming dislodged by her violent kicking, hitting and threshing for air. Her face, dark blue with grotesquely protruding tongue, was rather shocking when contrasted with the pretty animated expression it had had a few minutes before. After making sure that Susan was dead, I pushed her tongue back into her mouth and proceeded to dispose of the body in the manner I had been stimulated to devise when reading of the difficulties other murderers had experienced in this respect. About three weeks later, Sergeant Theron of the local police turned up and wanted to know if I knew anything about a Mrs Braithwaite. Sergeant John Theron on duty was a different man from the off-duty Johnny Theron, who occasionally, when suitably warmed, entertained us in the backyard of Wiggins' pub by giving a demonstration of Wild West six-shooting. I knew by the way his question was worded that he was sure I did know something about Mrs Braithwaite. I told him that she had been to see me one evening about three weeks before but that she had left again the same night. I went on to tell him that she had wanted me to help her, that we had quarrelled till she'd finally walked out of the house leaving her hat, gloves and suitcase behind. Theron asked to see her suitcase. He opened it. On top was a brown handbag, which was found to contain some money and a few loose keys, one of which fitted the suitcase. Theron then asked me what Mrs Braithwaite had been wearing that night. I gave him a genuine-sounding, yet worthlessly vague description of the clothes I had carefully packed, together with the handbag, in the suitcase three weeks before. Theron pulled out the one dress in the suitcase, which had obviously been worn, and asked me if that was the dress Mrs Braithwaite had worn that evening. Of course, I replied that it was not, but I knew that if that dress had already been described by anyone who'd seen Susan going to my farm, that description would be more or less the same as the one I had given. After asking a few more unimportant questions, Sergeant Theron left, taking the suitcase with him. I knew it would only be a matter of time before I saw him again. When Theron eventually came, it was with a man from the CID headquarters in Johannesburg. Inspector Liebenberg professed himself sorry to trouble me, but would I mind if he had a look around? I started the tour by taking them to the 300 feet long subdivided, intensive-type poultry house. I showed the policeman the incubator room and the brooder house. I then took them to the large corrugated iron barn which housed my machinery. A tractor, a threshing machine, a hammer mill and various smaller machines and my stocks of food. 
Round the sides of the barn were rows of large storage tanks, variously containing whole and crushed maize, maize meal, meat meal, bone meal, lucerne meal, and the various other poultry feed requirements I used for making up the different balanced rations. I could see their eyes measuring the tanks and the jotting down of copious mental notes. When they had seen the whole farm, Inspector Liebenberg thanked me for my trouble and departed. Rather depressed, I thought. <laughs> A week passed without event, though I began to get irritated by being under continuous surveillance. So I decided to bring matters to a climax. My best plan, of course, was to make Crippen's mistake and run away. Early one morning, I departed in my car. I headed into the veld and hid it well away from the road. I walked the rest of the way to the underground caves. I knew the fowls on the farm would be all right, as their food troughs held enough for about three days. The eggs would accumulate in the batteries of nests and ultimately make a mess, but. One cannot have murder without breaking eggs. On the morning of the third day, I imagine that things should be about ripe for me to put in an appearance again. As luck would have it, it was Sergeant Theron who met me first when I stepped out of the car in front of my house. He demanded to know where I'd been. I told him I'd gone to the caves to see if Mrs. Braithwaite had not perhaps gone there and got lost and died there, and that I had become lost myself and had found my way out only that morning. There were men everywhere, on the roof of the house, round the house, half under the house. There were men walking about with heads bent, examining the ground, men digging at various places. But the most joyous sight. Was the long hen house? The hens had very unwisely all been chased outside, so that the concrete floor inside could be examined. The diggers were being considerably hampered by the thousands of hens who were trying, with hen-like persistence, to go back where they belonged. The men became lost to view in a cloud consisting of a mixture of fine particles of manure, straw, earth, spilled food, and down. Of course, they never found Susan's body on my farm or anywhere else, nor any trace of it. They examined the stove for any signs of human ash. They dug up the drains, all to no avail. Finally, they had to give up, baffled. And no matter how much they suspected that Susan had been murdered, they had no proof. That Christmas, to show there was no ill feeling. I sent Sergeant Theron a brace of cockerels. The months passed in uninterrupted peace. My content was marred only by the news that Sergeant Theron was leaving to join the Rhodesian police. We gave him a fine farewell party. Bill Wiggins providing the drinks, while I contributed the poultry. The building of a new brooder house began to occupy all my thoughts, but doing it by myself took all my time. With the result that I could not keep my house clean and tidy, so I engaged the housekeeper. She's most efficient, yet her warm smile suggests that she could be very kind and affectionate. I'm looking forward to having an interesting time. Shall I get this published? I am particularly curious about Theron's reaction should he read this, and so learn the makeup and constitution of those plump chickens he so enjoyed. Well, how was he to know that those chickens had been feeding on the body of Susan Braithwaite? I do not mean by crudely pecking at it. On the contrary, the fowls ate Susan in well-balanced rations. Every bit of her body had been through the hammer mill to be ground into fine bone meal and meat meal, a separate process made blood meal. These processes entailed no difficulty, as I'd learned how to do it from an article in the Farmer's Magazine. I'd only to take extra care that every single piece of the body was powdered. The teeth I had to put through the milling process a couple of times, and the hair I burned on the head, making a sort of charcoal. The meat meal, bone meal, and blood meal were fed to my experimental batch of chicks, and what fine chicks they grew into! 
as Theron can testify. This will surely be brought to the attention of Inspector Liebenberg. I hope the good inspector is not driven to trying to make this story of mine have the value of a legal confession. It would be a great pity if an ardent student of detective fiction, desirous of seeing a story of his own published, should be arrested because he invented a feasible explanation to account for the disappearance of a woman he happened to know. My housekeeper may turn out to be a disappointment after all. Her solicitude on my behalf is overwhelming and I now seem to have no privacy left. She has no one to miss her and I am most eager to rear especially good stock next season fed with rich and well-balanced rations. The president of the National Poultry Society has expressed a desire to see my farm and the fine pullets and cockerels for which I am now so justly famous. To quote the bard, murder most foul. Chickens make very poor suspects since they are so difficult to fingerprint. But my taste buds are now overstimulated and I must depart for a light repast, washed down with a full-bodied red. Rhode Island red, of course. Until we meet again, this is Alfred Hitchcock wishing you pleasant dreams. The Late Alfred Hitchcock Presents is presented by The Late Alfred Hitchcock with the help of the actor Michael Roberts. It is produced by Frank Sterling at Unique for Radio 7. Welcome to the late Alfred Hitchcock Presents. I'm Alfred Hitchcock and I'm sorry I'm late. The pressing theme of this story is the shortage of suitably proficient dancing partners. I once attempted to corner this niche market by opening the Nijinsky School of Ballroom Dancing. Unfortunately, my backers had misunderstood me and employed totally unsuitable tutors. However, my first diploma student did have the distinction of winning the 330 at Newmarket. And now, The Dancing Partner by Jerome K. Jerome. This story comes from Furtwangen a small town in the Black Forest. There lived there a very wonderful old fellow named Nicholas Geibel. His business was the making of mechanical toys, at which work he had acquired an almost European reputation. He made rabbits that would emerge from the heart of a cabbage, flop their ears, smooth their whiskers and disappear again. Cats that would mew so naturally that dogs would mistake them for real cats dolls with phonographs concealed within them that would raise their hats and say, Good morning, how do you do? He was an artist. His shop was filled with all manner of strange things. He had contrived a mechanical donkey that would trot for two hours by means of stored electricity. A bird that would shoot up into the air, fly round and round in a circle, and drop to earth at the exact spot from where it started, and a gentleman with a hollow inside, who could smoke a pipe and drink more lager beer than any three average German students put together, which is saying much. Indeed, it was the belief of the town that old Geibel could make a man capable of doing everything that a respectable man need want to do. One day, he made a man who did too much, and it came about in this way. Young Dr. Follen had a baby, and the baby had a birthday. Mrs. Dr. Follen gave a ball in honor of the event. Old Geibel and his daughter Olga were among the guests. 
During the afternoon of the next day, some three or four of Olga's bosom friends, who had also been present at the ball, dropped in to have a chat about it. They naturally fell to discussing the men and to criticizing their dancing. Old Geibel was in the room, but he appeared to be absorbed in his newspaper, and the girls took no notice of him. There seem to be fewer men who can dance at every ball you go to. Yes, and don't the ones who can give themselves airs? They make quite a favour of asking you. And how stupidly they talk! They always say exactly the same things. How charming you're looking tonight! What a warm day it has been! Do you like Wagner? Oh, I do wish they think of something new. I go to a ball to dance. All I ask of a partner is that he shall hold me firmly, take me round steadily, and not get tired before I do. A clockwork figure would be the thing, or better still, one that would go by electricity and never run down. The girls took up the idea with enthusiasm. He would never kick you or tread on your toes or tear your dress or get out of step. Why, with a phonograph inside him to grind out all the stock remarks, you would not be able to tell him from a real man. Old Geibel had laid down his paper and was listening with both his ears. After the girls were gone, he went into his workshop, where Olga heard him walking up and down. And that night, he talked to her a good deal about dancing and dancing men. Asked what they usually said and did, what steps were gone through. Then, for a couple of weeks, he kept much to his factory, and was very thoughtful and busy. A month later, another ball took place in Furtwangen. On this occasion, it was given by Old Wenzel, the wealthy timber merchant. To celebrate his niece's betrothal, and Geibel and his daughter were again among the invited. When the hour arrived to set out, Olga sought her father. She tapped at the door of his workshop. He appeared in his shirt sleeves, looking hot but radiant. Don't wait for me. I'll follow you. I've got something to finish. Tell them I'm going to bring a young man with me, such a nice young man, and an excellent dancer. All the girls will like him. She had a pretty shrewd suspicion of what he'd been planning, and so, to a certain extent, was able to prepare the guests for what was coming. Anticipation ran high, and the arrival of the famous mechanist was eagerly awaited. At length, the sound of wheels was heard outside, followed by a great commotion in the passage. An old Wenzel himself, his jolly face red with excitement and suppressed laughter. Burst into the room and announced in stentorian tones, "Herr Geibel, and a friend. Allow me, ladies and gentlemen, to introduce you to my friend, Lieutenant Fritz. <laughs> Fritz, my dear fellow, bow to the ladies and gentlemen." Geibel placed his hand encouragingly on Fritz's shoulder, and the lieutenant bowed low. <laughs> Accompanying the action with a harsh clicking noise in his throat, unpleasantly suggestive of a death rattle, he walks a little stiffly, but then walking is not his forte. He is essentially a dancing man. I have only been able to teach him the waltz as yet, but at that he is faultless. Come, which of your ladies may I introduce him to as a partner? He keeps perfect time. He never gets tired. He won't kick you or tread on your dress. He will hold you as firmly as you like, and go as quickly or as slowly as you please. And he is full of conversation. Come, speak up for yourself, my boy. And immediately Fritz opened his mouth, and in thin tones that appeared to proceed from the back of his head, remarked suddenly, "May I have the pleasure?" Sure. Yet none of the girls seemed inclined to dance with him. They looked askance at his waxen face, with his staring eyes and fixed smile, and shuddered. At last, old Geibel came to the girl who had conceived the idea. It is your own suggestion, carried out to the letter, and the electric dancer. You owe it to the gentleman to give him a trial. She was a bright, saucy little girl, fond of a frolic. Her host added his entreaties. And she consented. Her Geibel fixed the figure to her. Its right arm was screwed round her waist and held her firmly. Its delicately jointed left hand was made to fasten itself upon her right. 
The old toy maker showed her how to regulate its speed and how to stop it and release herself. It will take you round in a complete circle. Be careful that no one knocks against you and alters its course. The music struck up. Old Geibel put the current in motion and Annette and her strange partner began to dance. The figure performed its purpose admirably, keeping perfect time and step and holding its little partner tight clasped in an unyielding embrace. It revolved steadily, pouring forth at the same time a constant flow of squeaky conversation. How charming you are looking tonight. What a lovely day it has been. Do you like our dancing? What a charming gown you have on. I could go on dancing forever, forever, forever. I could go on dancing forever with you, with you, with you, with you. With you. As she grew more familiar with the uncanny creature, the girl's nervousness wore off, and she entered into the fun of the thing. Oh, he's just lovely. I could go on dancing with him all my life. Couple after couple now joined them, and soon all the dancers in the room were whirling round behind them. Nicholas Geibel stood looking on, beaming with childish delight at his success. Old Wenzel approached him and whispered something in his ear. Geibel laughed and nodded, and the two worked their way quietly toward the door. This is the young people's house tonight, said Wenzel. You and I will have a quiet pipe and a glass of hock over in the counting house. Meanwhile, the dancing grew more fast and furious. Little Annette loosened the screw, regulating her partner's rate of progress, and the figure flew round with her, swifter and swifter. Couple after couple dropped out exhausted, but they only went the faster, to the length they remained dancing alone. Madder and madder became the waltz. The younger guests applauded, but the older faces began to grow anxious. Hadn't you better stop, dear? You'll make yourself so tired. But Annette did not answer. I believe she's fainted, cried out a girl who had caught sight of her face as it was swept by. One of the men sprang forward and clutched at the figure, but its impetus threw him down onto the floor, where its steel-cased feet laid bare his cheek. The thing evidently did not intend to part with its prize easily. The women grew hysterical. The men shouted contradictory directions to one another. Two of them made a bungling rush at the figure, which had the result of forcing it out of its orbit in the center of the room and sending it crashing against the walls and furniture. A stream of blood showed itself down the girl's white frock and followed her along the floor. The affair was becoming horrible. One sensible suggestion was made. Find Geibel! Fetch Geibel! No one knew where he was. A party went in search of him. The others, too unnerved to go back into the ballroom, crowded outside the door and listened. They could hear the steady whirr of the wheels upon the polished floor as the thing spun round and round. The dull thud as every now and again it dashed itself and its burden against some opposing object and ricocheted off in a new direction. And everlastingly, it talked in that thin, ghostly voice, repeating over and over the same formula. How charming you are looking tonight. Have you had supper, supper, supper? I could go on dancing forever. With you, with you, with you, with you, with you. With you. At last it occurred to one of the party that Wenzel was missing also. And then the idea of the counting house across the yard presented itself to them, and there they found him. He rose up very pale and followed them, and he and old Wenzel forced their way through the crowd of guests gathered outside and entered the room and locked the door behind them. From within there came the muffled sound of low voices and quick steps, followed by a confused scuffling noise. Then silence. Then the low voices again. After a time, the door opened, and those near it pressed forward to enter, but old Wenzel's broad shoulders barred the way. I want you, and you, Beckler. His voice was calm, 
but his face was deadly white. The rest of you, please go. Get the women away as quickly as you can. From that day, old Nicholas Geibel confined himself to the making of mechanical rabbits and cats that mewed and washed their faces. Well, I did persuade our mechanical genius to let me take a turn around the studio with the female version of his ingenious toy. But there seems to have been a mechanical malfunction here too. I programmed her for the gay Gordons, but she seems to have slipped into the ladies excuse me. Such a big hole in the studio wall. Well, as my dancing partner waltzes unsteadily down the steps of Broadcasting House, this is the late Alfred Hitchcock saying good night and pleasant dreams. Good night and pleasant dreams. The late Alfred Hitchcock presents is presented by the late Alfred Hitchcock with the help of the actor Michael Roberts. It is produced by Frank Sterling at Unique for Radio 7.